So, um, my name is Maciek. I, um, I had a pleasure and, uh, and a special chance to develop Greeks in Poland from the point zero. Uh, so I was the first person in Poland. And I'm mentioning that uh, because I'm coming from the position of knowing the organization um, and, well, non-governmental organization from the point of view of growth. So I was not parachuted uh, to the point to the position of the manager from somewhere else, but um, I was running this organization when it was two uh, two people, and now when it's thirty people in Poland. Uh, so um, I'm telling this uh, because I understand that many of you uh, come from different organizations. Some of them are much smaller than the Greek and not connected to the international networks. Uh, that's why I want to. Um, I assure you that, that we, I'm not going to, to give you an input now uh, from the point of view of the global organization. Additionally, I want to mention that I, I work with uh, also different NGOs in the past uh, and in different uh, parts of the world, in different cultures. So that also gives me some, some experience um, and, and, and allows me to basically to look at the challenges which, which are faced by, uh, by NGOs, uh, not from the point of view of Poland only, but much broader. Yeah. So, let me start from this first sentence, which I'm pretty much uh, very often giving as an opening statement. I come from the campaigning organization. As I told you before Greenpeace, and I did that. before Greenpeace, I was involved in other issues, not only environment most the human rights, um, um, independent media, and so on and so forth. So I work um, under this um, assumption. I assume that if someone is going into this kind of job, uh, in which you are, I assume, uh, then you are basically seeing it as a challenge for not just the, just the fantasy as a challenge, and you want to fight hard for what you do. Okay. I'm saying that at the beginning because you will see that later on through the points uh, which I will be touching, including fundraising. I assume that if, if and let's I refer to myself, if I want to reach my goals, then I want to, to fundraise. I want to have money as much as I can for my causes. And um, I want, if only possible, to feel independent. That's probably very important for you as well. For us, it's crucial. And I want to look at the fundraising also from the point of view of independence. So what kind of fundraising would strengthen my independence? So, um, first things first, as they say. Um, campaigning um, is not this. Does it come as a surprise to you? No? Okay, this is, this is the view of not only of, of us in Greenpeace, but many other campaigning, strictly campaigning organizations. We see campaigning uh, as a very often something which is the, um, basically reversed education. Why? Education is a process in which you start from one point, and then you sh you look for the you look for the connections, and everything is interconnected. So suddenly your scope is growing and growing and growing and growing. This is normal. If you have a very good teacher, then a good teacher is showing exactly that. The reductionist teacher is trying to put it down and down to the smaller uh, part, the smallest particle. The good teacher is showing you interrelations, the complex web of things interconnected. So this is. This is, this is a good education. Now, what we are trying to do in campaigning, usually, that exactly is, is confirmed uh, by, by well, different psychological, um, sociological and psychological studies. People do not act solely on the basis of education, solely on the basis of information acquired. Something must happen in order to get people engaged and acting so what we are doing is we start from the bigger picture uh, 
Let's, for example, think about the Arctic campaign of Greenpeace, because I guess many of you have heard about the current circumstances. Third of our colleagues uh, are currently in the RS in Burmans, in the detention center. So let's use this example. We started very broadly, uh, showing what's the problem, contacting investors, trying to basically move also the big reinsurance companies. So we started very broadly. And then what we were doing, we're trying to focus the attention of media, of people, on one or two spots. One of them was, for example, the Pilas Lomnaya platform of Gazprom, where our activists went to and were arrested. Um, the other good example is our uh, Polish campaign uh, connected with um, the Baltica motorway. We wanted to divert the routing of the motorway. Um, we wanted to change, you will see the, like, the slide later on, select, we wanted to change the basically the major motorway linking uh, Warsaw with um, Lithuanian, Pol uh, Polish Lithuanian border. But in order to do it, we had selected one spot on the whole route, which was Ruskuda Valley, and we made it big. That was our battlefront there. So we are trying to focus uh, attention of the people and get them engaged using specific point, specific point in our campaign. Yeah, you probably have heard about this term, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, <clears throat> this is extremely important because usually the people who come to the NGOs are very well educated in comparison to the rest of the society. So um, we come to this uh, work with the assumption that we have to, well, the assumption which we take from the educational system, that we have to basically prove that we are right. Mm -hmm. And by, by that, we have to basically answer each and every question, and we have to show a big picture. Well, now, if we go with the message, with the communication to the world, most of you are already probably um, um, are steeped in this situation, steeped in uh, more or less in campaigning. So you know that we bump on the situation in which the media say, sorry, it's just too complex. So it's, it's about um, choosing, not simplification, but choosing what's the most important and showing it as a kind of a pathway for the uh, audience with which, um, with which we'll be working with. Um, the other and very important thing is urgency. Why is it very important? Because there are so many urgent problems every day and uh, people are bombarded with so many messages every day also regarding the urgent problems that unless you present your case, the thing you believe in and you want to change as very urgent, it's not going to change. Simple as that. So one of the biggest challenges I experienced when working with different NGOs, um, and as I said, well, a few months ago I was in, in Georgia and Armenia giving the campaigning workshops for different organizations, also local ones, and I saw that for them, the, the one of the primary issues is basically how can I present my issue, my issue as super urgent. So this is the first. Um, exercise. And now, I was also asked um, during the preparation of, of this workshop, of the seminar, um, to tell you a bit more about planning. Because it's normal that in our NGO world, um, to the big extent, um, many projects or campaigns are spontaneous. They are basically popping up and then somehow we are trying to take them forward but they are not planned or they are not properly planned. So I picked up um, the most important issues regarding the planning of the campaign, especially regards communication, but not only, but especially regards communication, which I think are cornerstone <coughs> of a successful campaign. I believe that if these ones are not addressed, that the likelihood of the campaign failure is very big. That, that was my criteria. 
for the selection. So these are the first questions. Why the change hasn't happened already? The, the answer to the first question uh, allows us to um, avoid repetition of the past mistakes. Because um, very often, um, either in our country or in different country, some other group were, was trying to do something similar or the same. So learning on the past lessons. And then, of course, we have to ask ourselves, OK, so who is involved, not only on our side, but on the other side? Who is directly involved in the decision making? Who of them are our allies? Who of them are our opponents? And what is their position and their power? Um, you will see that um, this is of utmost importance because Without the creation uh, of something which um, uh, we call in our Greenpeace lingo um, the power analysis, what we see in front of us is just a, just a very vague picture. We do not see the, the, exactly the point which we need to move those forces at the political or media or economic scene which needs to be moved in order for us to, to reach the goal. Uh, let me just give you now just very general uh, insight from my side. So, instead of abstract um, explanation, I will also give you an example. Greenpeace was running a campaign several years ago aimed at stopping something which is called patenting of life. So the corporations wanted to have, um, usually uh, biotech corporations wanted to have a possibility of patenting basically uh, the, the genome and co concrete um, uh, constructions made from the genome. Potentially in the future could be also like cloned sheep or kids or whatever. So we wanted to stop that and uh, there was a huge campaign in Europe, very successful in terms of the awareness. And we almost thought we were going to win it, and then we lost it in the very last round. Because in the very last moment, the, the, the industry, through the lobbying, managed to sneak in additional para, which basically, to the law, which basically made our whole work of many years in vain. So only after, many years afterwards, through the, the judicial work, we were able to reverse that. That shows how important it is to focus always on the goal, on the objective, and not on awareness raising. I'm always saying awareness is never, it should be never a goal in itself. That it should be always as much as possible a smart objective and awareness could be a, a vehicle, a tool to each other. So when you do the campaign and whatever you do, whether it's actions, direct actions or the court case or whatever, if you want to change something which is tough to change and there are vested interests, like even in this case, uh, then you have to understand that very often the decision makers understand only the language of power. Yeah. And what that means is that they either are teased to do something because they think that they can basically get their, for example, polls up yeah, by doing what you would like uh, them to do, or they are threatened. Very often, or I would say my experience is most politicians understand the language of gain, or a threat. Now, we do not have troops, yeah? so we have to create a force in different way. But it's very important, and what forces me is in the sense that if I do one thing and there is no reaction, I'm ignored, yeah? for example, or there is basically they say no, then I, I have to be prepared before I start a campaign. I have to know what will happen next, so how I will escalate it. So, what does it mean? If I start from a very high point, if I do something very bold and brave, and then I have no space for escalation, then it's very bad. <laughs> so this is, this is one thing. Um, the other thing, you said uh, we should dis uh, make a distinction between uh, media attention and the media recognition and the people's engagement. These are two completely different things. 
So the good campaign uh, usually provides the way, the vehicle for the people to engage. And that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, if media are obviously very helpful, but sometimes I know some campaigns where the media were not super involved and not covering some issues in a, in a very broad manner. Still, the public engagement happened. So I will give you uh, two slides uh, showing what could be done when you basically start preparing this cornerstone of the cornerstone of the campaign, which is called Power Analytics. I'll give you the example of what we did when I still worked for Green International and I was responsible for the agriculture campaign, sustainable, sustainable agriculture campaign of Greenpeace in Asia and then also uh, partially for a global campaign. So the first thing we had to do was to analyze who is against us, and not only against us, but who is in the game. So, uh, in this case, that's very clear at the top level we have 7 billion of consumers. Everyone usually eats three times a day, not everyone, but well, usually, yeah, three times a day. Now we have the next level, if, when we take the, usually the, the food from, at least in our part of the world, is retailers. And for example here, you have a situation of already a very strong oligopoly. Only five retailers in EU account for 50% of the market. Then we go down through the food chain and we see that food processors and manufacturers, this is for example the cocoa market, the monopolization goes even farther. Huh? There is even less companies controlling bigger share of the market. Now we go into one step down, agricultural commodity traders. These are the people you, you don't know the names of. So for example the companies like Bungie or um, Cargill or uh, ADM, you didn't hear the names of these companies because they are not exposed to the consumer. <coughs> but these are the ones that really pull the strings. 80% of all the grain in the world is being basically in the hands of four companies. That's, an, that's unbelievable, uh, the, the power which is wielded in, by these companies. Then we have producers, which means farmers, 1.7 billion farmers. And now, let's play. In this game, finish the sentence. Most of the farmers in the world are... Hmm? <laughs> Most of the farmer, farmers of the world are... Subsistence farmers? Might be, I guess I don't know. But in this case, the, the ending is women. Usually, we don't associate at least I a Poland. Say men. I say yes, men. exactly. Are uh, 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 women? No, are women really? Um, and then, even before them, there is something called agricultural inputs, which means those who provide things like seeds, um, or pesticides, or um, or other so-called inputs in agriculture. <coughs> and here we have six companies which com control 75% of this market. So again, situation is, is very, very peculiar. So this is the first thing. And this is the thing we will be working on. Don't be put off by this, by this line, okay? <laughs> actually, it's not, it's, actually, it's quite, quite simple. What you see here, you see the vertical axis, which says high influence or low influence. And the horizontal axis, which says sympathetic, which means sympathetic, to the objective or the goal you are trying to reach, or hostile. The preparation of the proper panel per analysis, depending on um, how complex your campaign is, may last from at least one day, I would say, to one week. Because you will be quarreling, and this is exactly about it, People who are, or want to work on the campaign, they should quarrel, they should argue. For example, why do we put the word bank here? Is this the, the, the right position for the word bank? Um, so, just to give an example, big seed companies, you saw them, 75% are uh, controlled by the five or four companies. 
uh, on, the, on the slide <coughs> before. They are the ones who are extremely hostile to our goal, which is basically making uh, the, the agriculture, <coughs> agroecologic, so basically something very similar in the market lingo to organic, but much also much more localized. We want our goal is basically to have an, to merge organic agriculture with much more localized agriculture. So that's our objective, very much simplified. And these seed companies are not only very hostile but extremely influential. So for example, here you see this gates. Do you know why? Gates? Yeah. Gates Foundation. Gates ah. Foundation. Yeah. So we we uh, commissioned a thorough research on the Gates Foundation because already some years ago Gates Foundation um, started to move very strongly into the issue of global agriculture, funding, especially funding the research. Um, and because Bill Gates we know where we, when, we, when he came from. He believes in the technological things. So he believes that uh, the problems of agriculture could be just for, uh, solved by better technology, uh, which is also co um, confirmed by um, his personal investments in the companies like Monsanto. So uh, at, the, at the moment, we found out after the research that actually he gives more money in funding for industrial agriculture model then the organizations like the FAO, like Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So he's already at, therefore we decided, he is more powerful than FAO. And it turned out to be true. So um, here, for example, you see that we positioned ourselves, because we were just starting the campaign, this, 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 concretely this campaign, as quite low at the level of influence. So being humble, it's important to <laughs> <coughs> um, And then you can start to create the whole map. Now, why is it different? Why is it so important? First, if you do this correctly, then you will see whom and where you would like to move. Because that doesn't stop here. Afterwards, you will, you, what you will do is essentially to say, okay, we have big seed companies. If they are so hostile and so powerful, what we would like to do with them? If they are so hostile, would you try to convince them to bring them to your side? No. Don't do that. That's my advice. If you want to bring someone closer to your, to your side, then these people who are here, who are sitting on the fence, so the, who are neutral, because these are your natural potential allies. These you can move and you create a bigger critical mass. Usually, these guys who are extremely hostile to your, to your objective, they are not going to be moved by argumentation. They, have, they might be moved, being forced to do so. So, in this situation, those who are hostile and very <coughs> influential, what your campaign should try to do is to weaken them in order to reduce their influence. Whereas, for example, these guys who are on your side sympathetic to you but not that influential, what you want to do is to move them up. You want to increase their influence because usually in campaigns, especially in the ones in which, uh, which are basically tackle something difficult to change, uh, this balance looks like that. So we are the weaker guys against the much more powerful ones. The more information you have, the more reliable information on each and every actor, the more accurate your map will be. So for example, as I said, we commissioned the research on the Gates Foundation because we didn't know exactly how much money is, is Gates putting into funding. So that that research gave us uh, an intelligence which enabled us to put the gates there. So research, previous research is crucial. Now obviously if you have a research you still have to discuss it. And um, in this case, for example, we decided the gates is still lower than their um, large food retailers because they are the closest to the consumers. 
they are even more powerful than gates in the sense that they are their tentacles yeah, are reach much, much broader and if they, uh, they switch, if they are moved, then they power over the market. As, as you saw, if you saw on the previous slide, they are here, but that means that if you switch retailers at large, then the change starts to drop down. You understand what I mean? No. So, if I... Now I'll give you an example. When we worked with the, on our GMO campaign uh, against the genetically modified organisms, when we switched the retailers in Europe, uh, and meaning that we basically convinced them through the public pressure that it's better for them basically uh, to support the consumers, and the consumers in Europe said, we, in Europe said uh, that we don't want it. That meant that these retailers started to send a signal down to their production and distribution chain saying we don't want it. So because you are smaller, you don't have resources, you have to think strategically and looking for um, something like the leverage points. Where is the leverage point? You know what is the leverage point? You have a lever, you put it in the right point and then your power is much stronger. All right. So one of the most uh, challenging moments for the NGO is how to make the, the campaign sustainable for a, a longer period of time. Because then it hurts them. And when it hurts them, they start to move. Honestly, it's like that. Yeah? Okay, um, I promised to give you also some insight into communication and fundraising. I have not much time, around 20 minutes according to... Yeah. So I have to go through that now. One, and a thing which is always worth to remember, that in terms of the communication of your issue, you should start with your own business. It seems to be uh, uh, basically a completely well-known thing, but it's not, as I observe very often. So for example, uh, if I want to serve, save the forest, and I start to frame my arguments in terms of biodiversity, but no one who really is the stakeholder around this forest is buying it, then I'm not going to, to, to take it to take it off very very far. So I have to uh, think that may I have to think and look for the uh, look for the let's say the, the stakeholders profile on this issue. If uh, some of them, for example, use this forest as an exercise area, maybe I could start talking to them from that angle. Sometimes, obviously, uh, uh, the, the most of the people view, uh, so the stakeholders, view the thing you want to change or you want to save as completely opposite. So if the situation is that most of the people around the forest, view this forest as only a cubic meters of timber, then it's a problem. Then you have to reevaluate if either basically not to go in this campaign or to look for a much more powerful ally. Yeah. In this case, maybe it's the EU Commission. Very important thing is though that uh, to analyze where does the majority of the audience on the issue is. Um, the next thing is make it black and white. Make it, it basically make make your issue to basically be seen as urgent and something which which is difficult to ignore. And this is once again uh, coming back to what I told you before that your issue is competing with many others. It's true. Well, every one of us is 24, has 24 hours, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. And most of the 20 of hours we work, uh, we earn money, we deal with our kids, we, we study, and so on and so forth. So that essentially shows that um, what you want, what, you, what we should do is, is basically to take out of your issue what's the most blatant, yeah, what's, for example, the most scandalous. Uh, and basically put it at the forefront. Here is uh, Mr. Banksy uh, 
picture uh, which was made for our um, forest campaign of okay, Greenpeace. Yeah. And in a way, what, what is it for? Is to, to basically see <coughs> the situation that you want to change as absolutely, blatantly unacceptable. And so people just say, no, just we can't ignore it. Yeah? Many campaigns, just to let you know, had to wait a long, long time for that, um, um, for that moment. Um, maybe I shouldn't call them campaigns, but, but movements. Uh, just let me, uh, probably you don't know that because it's not being taught, at, unfortunately, at the uh, well, educational systems and the universities or what have you. But both the suffragette movement, women's rights movement, and the black liberation movement, it took them three generations to change what they wanted to change. Three generations. Yeah, so uh, that's also to say that until you have to work on quite much sometimes, until your issue becomes, gets to the level of the society saying, well, we can't accept it anymore. Now, this is, this is uh, extremely important. Once again, we are taught to use arguments. Our universities, our schools are training us to basically be good and responding to the question of the teacher, uh, mostly. But this is not how things work. So, that's why the real things and not arguments are something which makes the campaign tick, which makes media follow your campaign. What does it mean the uh, real things? Um, obviously, it could be direct actions like fantastic example. I really like the example of the cages. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good one. Um, <clears throat> but this is, this is not the only thing. And I, I guess, especially in our area, I guess well, all of you are from the Central Eastern Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say my per perception is that one of the completely underused tools in our part of Europe or the world is this, legal action. So imagine a situation when, for example, you do something. This is something we were trying to do recently, but we failed. We were trying, we launched a campaign which had the A hidden objective. This hidden objective was the, the target we were, we were targeting. We wanted to sue us. We wanted them to sue us. We wanted them to get us to court because we thought that if that happens, we have a chance to win. And that would be a seminal for, uh, uh, verdict. Yeah? As that was about climate and, and, and energy. And essentially, we wanted to lead the situation in which there is a, 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 a legal drama. So people are basically uh, standing in front of the court, but at the end, the court says, well, actually, what Greenpeace did and said, actually, it was also connected with defamation, uh, it's not defamation. It's on the basis of the scientific, uh, uh, of, of the ba on the basis of the scientific grounds and scientific data, we can say it's not defamation. So we were playing with that, and obviously uh, you are smiling, but there were actually quite many lawyers involved in that before we started. But this is showing that this, that, that this tool of legal action, either if we are sued or we sue someone else, now we play with another tool, we want to sue the corporations for the harm uh, on health due to the coal burning. Right? We are looking into that. And if we get there, then obviously we have a very powerful tool which can be not only used for the media but also for investors because any investors will very, very soon know that the successful court case from our side will mean compensations which means the lowest lowered profits for them and expose um, such as films investigations um, I'm mentioning it because of two, two reasons one is because recently even film investigations meant, uh, made from the handheld cameras are being taken by the media very often. Yeah? Because if, if, the, if, if what is there is good, then the quality doesn't matter so much. Second, because it works. Why? In the US, already three or four states, 
at the state level issued legislation uh, essentially giving a criminal, I don't remember, I think criminal punishment in terms of the sentence in jail potentially for executive thing. So people were filming inside, for example, the, the, uh, the big, the big uh, industrial farms, uh, like you know, 10,000 hawks or something like that. And now in these states, this is, for, this is not forbidden, this is basically threatened by the sentence in jail. So that, that shows that it works because that's exactly why it's banned. Because when people see that, yeah, uh, then, then they start to basically be moved. Uh, one of the proponents of the um, sustainable agriculture, also actually producing meat, I would say, he has, he has this fantastic saying that the, the, the only thing, or the, the only thing which is necessary to change the, 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 the way the, the animals are treated is to give the transparent walls to the slaughterhouses. If that happened, everything would change. Huh? So his farm is exposed. Everyone can see, you know, how he doesn't think. Um, okay. Well, very important thing is the conflict. Uh, usually, this is not something which, uh, which again, we are trying to avoid. Yeah. Uh, I think most <coughs> of us. Uh, we do not want to basically go into war <laughs> unless we are forced to do so. Yeah? But again, uh, we do not, we cannot rather use sex or blood, yeah? So um, <laughs> usually not. So in terms of uh, the, the media approach, what's very important is at least to have this conflict. What could be a conflict? The conflict uh, could be really seen at a different level. It could be a protest in front of the ministry, but it could be sometimes a one and show I remember my friend from Lebanon. Um, uh, Greenpeace in Lebanon was running a toxics campaign there, and uh, once he was basically kind of threatened by the respective minister who was having these toxic issues in his portfolio. Uh, the minister said that if Greenpeace continue to do so, then well, they may end up in jail. Something around that. Now, what you do in such a situation? What would you do? To create, to basically use this threat as an opportunity for you by conflict. What he did, he called the journalists, he sent the press, or basically government journalists, and, and asked them to be in front of the ministry of that minister who was saying that. He came there with a suitcase and he said, Okay, these are my um, basically things for the jail, I'm ready. And this is exactly the, 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 the situation uh, in which, which shows that you can exploit even a threat. Yeah? Obviously, he, after such a, such a move, he was not jailed, yeah? because he, he basically got the media to himself and exposed, basically saying, well, you can do it, but it doesn't change anything in the sense of, of our, our campaign. Um, an important thing is that if, if the media and the public, uh, do, uh, if the media especially, do not see opposition, then they don't see the news worth it, uh, the event you're doing. Um, that's that's the, the quote from Timothy Christopher, the climate activist from the US, who decided in his court case, um, does anyone does anyone heard about this guy, what he did? Okay, so, <clears throat> he was not associated with any major um, environmental organization. Um, I think he, he, he comes, comes from Utah. And in Utah, uh, and, uh, there was an auction of the areas which would be open for, I believe, gas drilling. In those national parks, in one of the most beautiful places in the US. What he did, he went to this auction, probably a setup like here. He just entered the place, he was given this number, and he started to bid. And he outbid a lot of lots, a lot of, he basically became an owner of a lot of licenses. Obviously, he didn't have money. So when this turned out, he had to face a court case, and eventually, because he did not guilty, eventually, 
he was um, sentenced for two years in jail. And he served that. And he said, uh, referring to the conflict, that we must put the choice in front of Obama, who is the decider in this case. Either he will stop mountaintop removal, this is something which actually was referring to another thing, which is like cutting the top of the mountains to take the call from them. Uh, or he will have to send troops and arrest us day by day. So by putting the decision maker in front of the stark choice, the choice which he cannot avoid or she, or that, you are actually getting your uh, campaign and your communication much more interesting. That's risky, I know, but <coughs> more interesting and much more um, um, open for, 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 for being, being covered by the media. And here, uh, as basically, we go very quickly through something which uh, I call in my presentation communicating pictures. <clears throat> and this is because, well, you know this, this, uh, this saying, the picture is worth for more than a thousand words. And I have to tell you, I come from academia. I spent seven years working at the university. So I know the power of arguments and words. But after coming to Greenpeace, I uh, I have to admit that that's, that's true. The picture is worth more than 10,000 words. Yeah. So if you get the picture right, or the picture is interesting, then you can lure your audience into reading the words. Usually not the other around. Um, so if you think about picture, or a series of pictures you want to produce, you have to put yourself in the, the, the seat of, of a director of creating a storyboard. And um, those things which are real yeah, could be, as I said, occupying a tree, but could be a paying a surprise visit to a key politician. The surprise element is important. A few years ago, what we did uh, to then the deputy prime minister, what was his name, the one who replaced Blair? Brown, right? Yeah. Brown. So what we did, our climbers climbed to the roof, to his roof, and we basically installed the solar panels on his roof because he was blocking the deployment of the solar energy in the UK. So we basically wanted to show that, well, it can be done even on his own house. Yeah? It could be inviting, of course, invading a nuclear power plant, um, but it could be plenty of other things, uh, which, as I told you it, with the example of my friend from Lebanon, are not really cost consuming. Well, and here a few pictures. So these are the most dramatic pictures. You probably associate with Greenpeace. So these are the, not the most relevant to our case. These are uh, different ones, um, which are already not that dramatic, but also could be used. So what I told you at the beginning, urgency. Yeah? So this, this picture describes the, 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 the illustration of the urgency. If everyone, if people see five to to noon, 5 to 12, that they understand immediately what is the issue. You can show it a different way, but showing the urgency is key. Working with graphics is very important, and uh, I would say, um, I have the saying that if you don't need the, how do you say, the, the text on the banner, then you are reaching the holy grail of the communication picture. Because the best pictures are the pictures which are understood by themselves. So you don't need to have a banner there. These are the best kind of pictures. Um, you can have uh, the sense of humor. Yeah? You can use the sense of humor, which is also, I think, not used enough in our campaigns. That's, that's my take, at least. Uh, ridiculing them. Satire. You know, uh, when I, for example, look at, at some of, of the works of, especially in the Anglo-Saxon uh, part of the world, uh, UK and the US, I see it's used much more often in our world. And, work. and <coughs> these are the pictures which I would, uh, let's say, more sophisticated, yeah? So if you look at these pictures, I look at, at your faces and you start to like, yeah? You have to basically spend a bit more time. So 
my advice would be if you use these, use them rather to their audience, which is already familiarized with your issue. And what you want to do, you want basically to bring them higher in terms of the level of engagement. And now a bit of uh, the last part about um, connection to fundraising. So, I told you at the beginning that we, we wanted to, to stop the Diabaltica, not stop, divert the Diabaltica route. That was the route which was planned. That was the route which eventually was done, thanks to the, our campaign. Um, our goals one by one was that we wanted to empower a major part of the population. So, thanks to that, the commission, the EU Commission would act and it would force the Polish government to stop the construction, which happened, fortunately, according to the scenario. Now, what we did, now, that, that's the, the fundraising part starts. So. Um, one of the things we did, we created a passport yeah, so there was a Republic of Rospuda Valley. I told you that we fought with the battle. We had a camp in the winter with minus 25 around. And we invited people to basically stand with us. So this idea of becoming a, a citizen of the Republic of Rospuda actually took off. And thanks to that, we obviously could go farther. This is called in, in English, it would be adopt tree. So people could donate to us through the free adoption online. Um, and at some moment, we even went that far that we asked people uh, to give us a donation in kind. So we said, listen, <laughs> and actually it, it was not planned uh, fundraising wise. It was like, listen, we need your help because we are uh, lacking everything, food, uh, blankets, tents, sleeping bags, cars, if you can share it with us, please do. Yeah? So what happened is very interesting. When people hear that, that message, this is not a typical fundraising message, right? So what happened, first we started to receive those, but then these people who couldn't give us these started to donate through, to our, through different channels to, to make these, much more than before. Because they, they, they heard the message which was, um, surprising a bit, more direct, and they felt, they felt it, was <coughs> honest. it was not like give us money for our, I don't know, um, our um, forest seal, you know, or something like that, the standard, let's say, let's the standard um, um, fundraising message of the environmental organization, but it was very direct, very focused on that project, and people understood that we are really in need of the funds. So that refers to the fundraising connected with the concrete project. I believe that even smaller NGOs, and I actually worked before and in between <coughs> helping the smaller NGOs to look for the fundraising possibilities for the concrete projects, also in the midst of this project. Some of the first uh, successful things we've done is was when we wanted to publish the advertisements and we didn't have money. Sometimes you can get them for free. Sometimes you have to pay something, not the, the commercial fee, but something. And then we were, the NGOs were asking people to basically donate the money for the concrete goal of publishing the ad. The other thing um, which I wanted to share with you was also connected with fundraising, not through the direct way. But not through the direct way, I mean, it was not fundraising meant by door-to-door -door programs, direct dialogues, because I understand that this is not of the main importance to most of you. So this is part of our, our Arctic campaign, and uh, we teamed with the Yes Men people. Have you heard about them? Yes. Oh. Yeah, so they created something called Yes Lab, if you didn't hear about this, when they basically try to cook different uh, uh, um, I wanted to say stunts, but it's much more than stunts. Performance. Performances, but well, stories, media stories essentially, uh, but not by themselves, but 
basically collaborating with others and sometimes others doing their own. So we, uh, we teamed up with them uh, several times recently on the Arctic campaign. And the idea was that we invite people to using giving them basic tools to create their own uncommercial. So basically something mocking up then existing and very broad uh, shell campaign. And we told them, listen, uh, we want what we do is that the one which will basically be voted as the most interesting, we will basically hang it at. We will hang it at, at one of the shell uh, billboards. But additionally, what we want to do, please donate, because we would like to publish them, your products, the ones which you prepared, as much as possible. So it was really cool, yeah, because people thought, well, uh, first I can do it, I can give my creativity. First, even if I don't, basically, uh, I can basically support the others. So at some areas, if the issue is already known, uh, this, is, this is also potentially uh, a fundraising tool for your outreach, for your communication. And this is the, uh, the very recent one uh, from Poland. Uh, so um, you remember the Adopt a Tree I told you a few minutes ago. This is Adopt a Bee. <laughs> So we uh, developed this concept further. We started our sustainable culture campaigns in Poland from the issue of the bees. And we wanted also to test some fundraising possibility. So what we, after presentation of the campaigns, after the big picture, uh, we wanted also to give people that the, the media were already informed that the issue was already high, even before we started, because the issue is already high in the media. We said, Okay, we would like to give you um, some possibility of getting something done, done for the bees. So what people were doing, and this is very important, they were not giving us the money. This is, you don't see, this is like a puzzle. Every part of the puzzle, uh, <coughs> or the honeycomb, um, meant some some of the nations, the smallest nation was very small, two zlotys, so like a half a euro, 50 euro cents. And uh, after the, basically this, the sum of the nations were given, the puzzle was unveiled. Yeah? And eventually that was the whole picture prepared by the famous cartoonist in Poland. So, but the money will be spent on 100 bees hotels in Poland. So what we don't, this is not money for us. Yeah? All the money will go to the Beast Hotels. Beast Hotels, do you know what is that, the Beast Hotel? No. The special, basically, construction of a place where the bees, the bees and not only bees, also other pollinators, can nest. They need that. And actually, it could be done also in the cities. So, the money goes there. But what do we have? We have contacts. We have addresses of these people. So what we can do now, we can ask them next time, and we are going to get back to them next year, when we go into the much stronger fight with the industry, we're going to ask them for donations. We're going to ask them to support us. Now we have a very, the, the, the addresses of the people who are in the lingo of the fundraisers, they are hot addresses. Yeah? Because these are the people who are not random. These are only ones who are our allies, who want to support us. So, I'm finalizing now. Um, I want to just highlight two things from this slide. First is this. This is a natural tendency in all NGOs, pretty much. To communicate with the supporters. And not with the audiences which you, you have to bring, or you, and you can bring, about for change. That's why you did this. Because without that, you do not know exactly whom you need to change. And when you know that, that you know that you have to communicate with them in order to change, and not only with your existing supporters. And the second is, is this one, is that um, whenever you see the success in the media, not whenever, but very often when you see success in the media, you feel, oh, it's fantastic, yeah? 
Um, but you have to listen as much as, as, as you are listened. Because uh, many campaigns, as you already saw in these examples, and I mentioned to you before, uh, can have fantastic media coverage and still, and still fail in reaching the objective. Because, for example, you have a very nice sympathetic media, uh, but uh, they are not listened by decision makers. They have no influence, no leverage over them. And let me leave you with this, this slide at the end. Thank you very much.